Hello and welcome to our Bible study. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4 today. And uh, I just have to say, I'm recording this on December 1st. 2021, and I cannot believe that it is December, and I can't believe that it's 2021. The last couple of years have been so up and down, and at times it has moved very quickly, for which I think we're all very thankful, and at times it has been like pulling a sleeping elephant through a swimming pool of molasses uphill. <laughs> you know, it just absolutely uh, a hard slog at times, all of which will relate to our text today, Mark chapter 4, and the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils, depending on how you look at it. We'll look at it both ways, actually, today. We're going to dive in and see what is Jesus going to teach us about our relationship with God and our really even our relationship with one another as fellow believers through this story, and how does that relate to all of these hard ups and downs we've gone through the last couple of years? I think you will find something here that will be challenging. You will find something here that will be very encouraging. Uh, so stick with us and grab your Bible as we dive into Mark chapter 4. So in Mark chapter 4, we kind of shift gears. The last couple of things we looked at, Jesus was dealing with some real opposition to his teaching and to his claims to be the Son of God and the Messiah. And now we shift gears and he takes some time, Mark does, to share some of the things that Jesus was teaching to those crowds that were continually growing and gathering around him. And some of the things that he taught were in what we call Parables. Parables are uh, simple illustrations, st simple stories from everyday life that teach a deeper spiritual meaning. And some of them are really easy to understand, and some of them take a little bit of work. But that's actually that's part of what we're going to look at in the text as Jesus explains why that might be. So let's go ahead and read the text. I'm going to read from the New International Version of the Bible and start in Mark chapter 4 verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake and the crowd gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. And then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Okay, so if you read that story and you're left there scratching your head going, I, I, I don't get it. Or you look at it and you say, okay, so we have seed. This guy's just out there throwing it all over the place. Why is he doing it like that? That's not the way we do it. Or you're wondering, well, why would you even throw seed on some of these soils? Clearly, that was going to be a challenge or a fail. And so you're left scratching your head. You are in good company, <laughs> okay? The disciples themselves, they didn't get this at first either. They have to kind of go to Jesus behind the scenes and are like, so Jesus, I know you said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, I, I heard, but I don't think I, don't think I heard the point. What, what exactly is going on? Jesus used parables in the way that he did for two reasons. One is that illustrations from everyday life do help us often to understand uh, deeper concepts, truths, spiritual truths, uh, principles, values in uh, very simple ways. Okay, analogies are, I'm a Texan, we, we speak in analogies all the time. So analogies can be, uh, for some people, very helpful for uh, understanding deeper truths. But sometimes 
they still require a little bit of explanation. And Jesus used these analogies because sometimes they didn't require explanation. The people who wanted to get it, got it. And that's what he means by whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. If you want to know what's going on, I want you to understand this. But if you're already blowing me off anyway, I'm not wasting my time. And that might seem harsh, but understand, he's telling this story at a time of peak resistance from people who not only don't get it, but people who do not want to get it. And not only do they not want to get it, but they don't want other listeners to get it either. And so they want to turn everything into a debate. By telling these parables, a lot of times the, those people, the people who just wanted to debate and argue but not learn, walked off didn't care, just went, ah, whatever. That didn't make any sense. And the people who really wanted to learn were left there to seek more clarity, to ask questions, and to learn. And that's what happened, okay? So that's what happens in this text here. The disciples, in verse 10, are with Jesus alone later on, and they seek some, uh, some clarity on this story, and Jesus offers it. So let's look and see. What, why is this story so confusing? Because he can't just be telling us farming is hard, although he's definitely telling us that you know by purpose or by accident, by implication. Uh, farming is hard. We appreciate farmers. We appreciate the risk they take. We appreciate that they are at the whim of nature and many other variables outside their control. And certainly that is true when we talk about sharing the truth as well. Uh, but what does, Jesus, what does Jesus mean by this story? Well, let's look again. Verse 10, when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. <laughs> Jesus, what do you mean? He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven." Okay, let's look at what he says here before we go any further. Uh, he says, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving. Now, is this what Jesus wants? No, Jesus wants what God wants. And Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that God wants all men everywhere to know the truth and to be saved. And all means all. This is what God wants. He wants everything everyone to come to the salvation that is found in the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, We operate from this base understanding. God wants all people, you people, you, to be saved and to be a part of the kingdom of God. This is a truth. It is a fact. This is who he is. And that plays into this parable in several ways, but also into this explanation. So when he says, they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. He's not saying, I'm keeping it a secret so that they don't hear, so that they don't understand, and so that they are not forgiven, because that's not what God wants. It's not what Jesus is even on the earth to accomplish. He wants all men, including the Pharisees, to be saved. Say, well, then why is he telling these parables so they won't find forgiveness? That's, that's looking at this backwards. What he's saying is, I'm telling these parables because there are people who do not want to understand. There are people that are going to listen and see, but never hear and never understand and never perceive. Otherwise, if they saw and if they heard, they would be saved too. And they, the implication is, and they don't want to be. So I am moving on. I'm teaching you who are hungry. I am seeking those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Do you remember what is said in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's what he's addressing here. He's saying, I am telling parables and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving some of these people out because I've given them a chance and all they're doing is fighting me. They don't want to see. They don't want to hear. Otherwise, they'd find the salvation that I'm offering, but they don't want to find it. So I am now focusing my attention on those 
who have ears to hear so that they will understand. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean if you at first don't understand this that you're one of those people he's turning away from. That is not the point of any of this teaching or this parable. I think that's important to say because we can misidentify ourselves or other people as, well, they're having a hard time. I guess it was never meant for them. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that if you're being obstinate, stubborn, and hard-headed, and you don't want to know, okay, okay. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to hear it. God wants you to understand it. But He's not going to do like these uh, cruel farmers who raise the geese with uh, intent to make foie gras. He's not putting a tube down your throat and stuffing it down your stomach. Okay? There's no force feeding in the kingdom of God. If you don't want to hear it, you don't have to hear it. Right? And so this is what he's getting at. But if you want to hear it, he's going to tell these stories so that you have to lean in to understand. And as you lean in, What does that tell us? You want to know. So you lean in and you listen, and Jesus is inviting you in to hear even more and to understand even more. And he goes to verse 13 and says, Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. So Jesus opens up the story to these disciples so that they can understand because they have leaned in. They have proven, I have ears to hear Jesus. What do you have to say? And he shares it with them. So let's go back and look. There are are four different kinds of soil. Let's take the obvious stuff first, right? There are four kinds of soil. We don't have to do a lot of heavy lifting on the interpretation of this because Jesus says, here's what I meant, guys. Here's what it was. So let's just listen to what Jesus says it is. In verse 15, he says, first, there is seed that is sown and some of it falls along the path. Let me just, let me pause before we get into the path. Let me pause for a second. I almost skipped something very important. If you are uh, familiar with modern farming, you know that it is absolutely incredible what can be done now. Um, I know farmers who have equipment that measures uh, the amount of seed to a ridiculous specification. Uh, It can tell them which row, how many of those seeds roughly have gone into that row and give you GPS coordinates to where in that field those seeds were sown. There are not people anymore sowing along the roadside. There are not people who have seed that falls along the path in the hard places and among the thorn bushes if they have this kind of equipment. We have got some very high-tech stuff going on that is really impressive, but that is not how they sowed seed in the first century. Part of their uh, process of throwing seed was to to broadcast it. Okay, so they would carry a bag of seed and they would they would scatter it and broadcast it. Just like when you go out to seed your lawn, you have one of those. Maybe you have one of those. Uh, my grandfather had you strapped it on your shoulders and you have a tank of seed here and you turn a crank and it broadcasts the seed and scatters it out. That's called broadcast seeding, and that's much less uh, specific than uh, a satellite run seed counting through uh, a a laser light counting the seeds. Kind of a John Deere, right? Uh, It's broadcast farming, and and that's what they did back then. And as they did, some of that seed was just going to go all over the place. And 
when it did, it found different kinds of soil, and he's going to tell us about the different kinds of soil and the impact that location has. Because just like in real estate, it's location, location, location. In uh, regard to the soil, that then becomes a story of quality of the soil. What kind of health is in that soil? Well, if it goes along a path that is compacted, hard, dried out, uh, non-aerated soil, and it doesn't work. So verse 15, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown, and as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown. And Jesus compares that in the story to being, you know, you're sitting there just on top of the soil, and, and so there's no root. You're just sitting there, and what happens? Well, the birds just come. I'm a hunter. I see this all the time. There would be a feeder out there uh, in some places. And at that feeder, uh, it throws out corn or whatever you're using at the time. And it just sits there on hard, trampled ground. It's hard and trampled because so many animals, different sorts, deer, raccoons, birds, you know, doves, everything, come in, hogs, to these feeders. And it gets very compacted around that feeder. And the, the seed just sits there right on top of it or on the, the cow path or on the ranch road. It all just sits there on top and it's very easy for these animals to come along and snatch it away. Well, when we have such a hard heart and the Word, which is the seed, the Word of God, comes and lands on our hard, compacted soil, sometimes, maybe it's a hard heart, Maybe it's a heart hardened by circumstances. Maybe it is a hard head, stubbornness, whatever. He doesn't go into that. That's kind of the thing that we have to sit there and go, why am I so hard headed? Why am I not taking this in? Well, he doesn't get into that, but that's something for us to examine in ourselves. When that happens, Satan swoops in. He knows that he can grab that, that opportunity of the Word of God and the Gospel to take root. He can easily take that away when we are hardened and stubborn and not listening. The soil he starts with are the people he says, yeah, those are the people who are never seeing, never hearing, never perceiving. Otherwise, they might actually find forgiveness, but no. Satan knows that and will take advantage of that, and the opportunity is gone. We might ask, well, then why did, he, why did he give them the opportunity in the first place? Remember what I, what I referenced from 1 Timothy chapter 2. God wants all men to be saved. And you say, but he knows they have hard hearts, doesn't he? He does. But God still loves them and he's still going to give them the chance, right? Right, we'll come back to that, but he's still gonna give them the chance. The next image is seed that falls along the rocky places. Now maybe uh, there's enough topsoil there that the seed takes root. You are open enough. Your, your heart and your mind are open and you, you hear the word of God and it takes root and you start, you start to listen and you start to believe, but, it still just has short, shallow roots. I'm from San Angelo, Texas, and if you're familiar with that area, you know you know rocky, uh, rocky places with thin places of topsoil. Those were the places we like to put our fences and uh, and dig post holes, and really should have been using dynamite, but, but we weren't. Uh, these are places where the topsoil, you saw me do this, but that's because I'm picturing what I often saw, where topsoil might be an inch and a half or two inches and just not much there. So there's enough to trigger the mechanism of seed growing, sticking just with the seeds for a second. There's enough there. You get some rain, stuff starts to grow up, but is that ever going to produce a crop? Well, no, because eventually what happens? That shallow soil uh, it, 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 die, it causes the plant to die out because it just can't go deeply enough to survive the summer. It gets too hot, there are too many challenges, too hot, too dry, and the plant dies because it just wasn't deeply rooted. It started the process with good promise, but ends the same way the hard soil did. It's all gone. Well, Jesus is saying, some people are like that. 
They receive the gospel. They receive the good news. They receive the kingdom of God, and they're excited about it. Uh, one teacher said they go out and they buy, you know, they go out and they buy a nice, beautiful new Bible, and they're excited about it, and and they're showing up at church. But then what happens? Well, the sun comes out, and the heat sets in, and the roots aren't deep enough to get down to the water below the rocks. The soil isn't deep enough, and they shrivel up. This doesn't delight God. He's not happy about this. Jesus isn't telling this story like, eh, it doesn't matter. We knew it was going to be that way. I think this breaks Jesus' heart because he loves it when we come to the kingdom of God in joy. What he's telling us is that there is a tragedy that happens among some. That they get in, they get excited, but the first hardship that comes along, or it just fizzles out, just dries up when the sun comes out. It's not even necessarily a scorching drought. It's just the sun came out, life happened, they drifted away, and they're gone. He says, this, this happens in the kingdom of God. And it breaks God's heart. It doesn't have to be that way, but it is that way. We'll come back to that. So then the third kind of soil is seed that falls among the thorns and the weeds. Okay, so obviously things can grow there, right? Uh, there's, there's soil there where things are growing, but they're not all the best things. And so this seed falls in there, but it's not alone. It's not just the kingdom. It's not seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. It's I seek the kingdom of God, but ooh, squirrel. I like that. And ooh, maybe I should get wealthy. Ooh, maybe I should chase that. Ooh, maybe I could do. Ooh, and maybe, and maybe, and maybe, and all the maybes choke it out because we only have so much life and so much attention. Well, I think we think weeds and we automatically think worries because that's one of the things that he says. And so we think they're all negatives. That's one of the things. He says, you know, it falls among the thorns. There are the worries of life. So maybe there's worry. Maybe there's sickness. Maybe there's hardship. I've mentioned the last couple of years. This has happened all over the place. The last couple of years have been thorny, weedy years. And we've gotten tracked by both of them. The thorns, the weeds, the worries, those things that cause us to have extra stress, extra tension, and questions and doubts, and, and we just shut down. Maybe God gets crowded out. Maybe God gets doubted out. But for whatever reason, we let our worries suck the life right out of us. And it's gone. Poof. Just gone. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. And it's one of those things that, uh, as a preacher, I see quite often. And there are times when it is so frustrating because it seems like no amount of encouragement can overcome the negativity that's just working on that person's heart and on their mind. Uh, for whatever reason, they succumb to worry, to doubt, to stress, to frustration, to whatever, whatever it is that's, that Satan can exploit in their heart and mind and in their messaging, their inner messaging, he exploits and it fizzles. And it's frustrating and it's heartbreaking to God. Again, Jesus says, this is the reality. He doesn't say, this is the way I like it. It's the reality. And some are choked out by negatives. Some are choked out by things that could be uh, neutrals. Uh, they're just distractions. They're just distractions. Uh, he says, wealth. Uh, they're, ch they're out there chasing money. You know, a lot of you are out there. You, money has been taught to you as the single most important thing in your life. And the problem is that if money is the single most important thing in your life, then who isn't? God. Maybe your spouse, too. God. Maybe your children, too. God can't be the first thing in your life. Family can't be the first thing in your life. Actually, family, let me just say this. Family, sometimes we treat like an idol as well. You know, I don't have time for the Lord because I have to take care of my family. Guess what? If you aren't taking care of your family's relationship with the Lord, you haven't put your family first. You've put them last. 
Because the most important thing you have for your family is a healthy relationship with God, that they find the kingdom. And that's your job to lead them to it. But we get distracted. Cars, houses, jobs, promotions, entrepreneurialism, neutral things in and of themselves. Not inherently bad, not inherently good. It depends on what we do with them and what we do for them. And he says some people get so choked out chasing those things, they miss the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and chase all these things but lose his soul? And I'm going to add in parentheses, or the souls of his or her family. What have you gained? God puts that, Jesus puts that in his illustration in the lost column. You may have the house. Your kids may be happy with all the things that you've bought them. Probably not for very long. They're going to want more. But the kingdom of God and their eternity is what it costs them. And it's what it costs you. And here's the thing. All that stuff you chase costs you time and money. But if it costs the kingdom, it costs your kids their eternity. And we've got to think about these things. And Jesus is trying to get us to think about them as we go through this parable. And he says, finally, and there, there's a fourth kind. Some seed falls among the good soil and it digs down deep with its roots. And it's well hydrated and well, uh, good nutrition in that soil. And it grows and it thrives and it enjoys all the blessings of the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, here are some questions that I think we have to ask ourselves. First, looking very honestly in the mirror, what soil do you think you are today? What soil do you think you are right now? Be real honest with yourself. What soil have you been? And don't, don't be afraid to say, I, I think I'm among the rocks. I think my roots are shallow. And I think that if the sun comes out and things get too hot around here, I may shrivel up. Maybe you feel that empty. Don't be afraid to acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. Here's why. Soil can be improved. Soil can be changed. I don't think that the parable of the soils, as often interpreted, is a fait accompli. I don't think that it is just a given that this is just the way it is. It's fate. Once a rocky soil, always a rocky soil. You know, there are houses around this area that are built out of the rocks farmers removed from the soil to make it arable. Farming is hard work. It takes soil amendments, improvements, removal of stones, cutting back of thorn bushes, and God is willing to do that work. The Spirit can do that work. I think the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils, is not so much about telling us three-fourths of these people that hear the gospel will never survive it. I think, I think that's the reality. I think that's the reality. But when we're looking in the mirror and asking ourselves the question, well, which have I been? I don't think it's a permanent answer. Hard-headed people can become humble. At one time, Paul the Apostle was Saul. Hard, compacted soil along the path. And then a farmer stepped in on the road to Damascus. We can change. Through the power of God, through the grace of God, by the Spirit of God. Our soil can, I believe this with all my heart, our soil can change. I have seen it over and over again. So many times the people that I thought were hard, compacted soil or thorn infested or rocky soil, in the long run, God caused a growth in them and a change of the heart and spirit. He removed their rocks. He weeded out the thorns and he transformed them and they became the good soil that lasted. 
And I know that's not totally what's pictured in the parable. I think the parable is meant to show us one picture, but it's not the only picture in the photo album. The other picture is this. God can change things. That's the rest of the gospel. Here's what you are, and here's where it'll go if you stay what you are. But God, who is rich in mercy, can He change your heart? Can He change your soil? Can He remove the rocks? Can He burn back the thorn bushes? Our God can, and I believe that He will. You know why? Because He is so determined to see things grow. Twice in this story, it started not with the seed and not with the soil, but with the farmer. In verse 3, he says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed because he wants you to know the kingdom of God. When he goes to explain it, verse 14, the farmer sows the word, the word of God. He sows it in your heart. He gives you a chance because God wants all people everywhere to be saved. Those who have ears to hear, lean in and hear that. God wants you saved. There is the reality of the soil that you are, and he tells you what will happen if you stay that way. But there's also the reality of the soil that you can be through faith in Jesus Christ by letting him make you new, by letting him remove those things in your life that are holding you back from being good, healthy soil. God can do that. And God wants to do that. God bless you. And join us again next week as we dive a little bit deeper into what God has to share with us. And in the meantime, if you need to know more about how do I get there, how do I get to where God changes my kind of soil, message me. And I will be glad to answer any questions that you've got. If you live anywhere near here, please come and visit us at the Early Church of Christ. We'll be glad to uh, explore any of those questions that we can because we, like God, want to see you know the kingdom and the grace of Jesus. Have a great week.